And uh, thank you again so much for everyone who is uh, in attendance today. Um, I'm really hoping my internet holds out. It did try and drop me once while I was waiting, but uh, it doesn't usually do that. So um, we should be okay. Um, so as you know uh, from the advertisements, um, I'm sharing with you some of my research um, that is pertaining to my PhD dissertation, and that's uh, gender intimate partner violence uh, treatment programs and, and the specialized courses as well. So I will start off with giving you um, a quick overview of some of the content that I will be sharing with you today. And I will start with some brief information pertaining to some of the judicial responses to intimate partner violence, as well as some of the more common methods of treatment that are currently in circulation throughout North America. I will also then go into uh, some details on the literature that really concentrates around gender and perpetration of intimate partner violence. This is also a key feature of my current research. Um, and then I'll walk you through my research questions, uh, my methodology. I do have a few preliminary findings um, that I am able to share today. And, and then I will also talk about some of the limitations to my study, um, unfortunately, which have largely been impacted by COVID-19. Um, so there are a few things that do need to be taken into consideration. So I will start off with giving just a very, very brief uh, roadmap as to what some of the responses to intimate partner violence have been that lead to my research questions. And I will start with talking about the mandatory charging and pro-arrest policies. So these were um, enacted largely as a result of the feminist movement in the 70s and were really intended to try and remove police discretion that had previously resulted in infrequent arrests for intimate partner violence. This was also aimed to take some of the onus off of women in being the ones responsible for making the request to have their abusive partner arrested. So to be very, very general, um, if there's evidence that a physical altercation has taken place, these kind of policies um, say that the police must uh, lay charges and make an arrest. But as further information uh, was learned about intimate partner violence, it was also realized that this type of behavior is often linked to other factors that might require some unique treatment. The specialized domestic violence courts were developed as a judicial response that's also able to address some of the underlying uh, reasons for abusive behavior as well as being able to offer appropriate sentences for the offenders. There isn't currently a universal model um, in place for the domestic violence courts, but their goals are ultimately uh, pretty much the same, and that's to provide some early intervention and access to treatment and rehabilitation for the offender, faster prosecution rates, and also considering victim safety in the process as well. Um, I believe we have a few people joining from other locations, um, but for some local context, New Brunswick does currently have one specialized domestic violence court, and it is located in Moncton. Now, that's not to say that other jurisdictions don't handle domestic violence cases. They absolutely do, uh, but the process does ultimately differ quite a bit. Also, as a result of the mandatory charging policies, there was then an influx in the amount of arrests made, and the justice system was also faced with what to do, um, especially because many of the offenders um, did and still do uh, qualify for probation or community-based sentences rather than incarceration. And treatment programs for intimate partner violence, they were already in existence prior to the specialized domestic violence courts, um, which actually weren't introduced into Canada until 1990. But the offenders weren't always accessing these programs on a regular basis. So the collaborative approach that the domestic violence courts take has allowed for some dedicated spaces in these treatment programs for offenders who have been referred through the courts and therefore can be fast-tracked um, into this type of intervention. And I will spend um, a few minutes talking about a few of the more uh, widespread types of programs. Um, the first one I would consider is one of the more well-known, uh, maybe one of the more famous types, uh, and this is the Duluth model. So this one originated in Duluth, Minnesota in the 80s. It takes a feminist-based approach to treatment and focuses on intimate partner violence as stemming from a patriarchal belief system that has taught men 
through socialization that it's okay to use controlling or abusive tactics against their partner. In terms of this kind of program content, the groups often consist of a combination of things like facilitator-led discussions, there's also feedback from other group members, and they also do role play activities. And all of these are trying to challenge beliefs and teach new ways of communicating with their partners. Uh, the group participants will also be often be taught how to use things like taking a time out. They'll learn new problem solving skills and tension reducing strategies and also work on developing some empathy and are asked to consider the experiences of their partner. What I also have for you on the slide here is you know, if you're familiar with this field of research or work in this area, you will probably have seen this um, and that's the power and control wheel. So this is a primary tool that is used in Duluth-based programs to present information to the participants about what various abusive tactics look like. I'm not sure how clear it is on, on your end, um, but some of these things include things like emotional abuse, economic abuse, using isolation, there's minimizing, denying, and blaming, uh, and a few other uh, categories there. They also use the equality wheel as well, um, which I didn't have room for on this slide, but it's formatted just like the power and control wheel. Um, and so instead of the categories on the wheel you have in front of you, um, which highlight the abusive behaviors, the equality wheel also includes uh, the alternatives. So those categories will include things like um, negotiation and fairness, respect, trust and support, um, so these are describing the alternatives for the participants and how to be a nonviolent partner. The participant commitment to this type of program um, is generally at least about once a week. It can also last for up to six months. When participants complete this type of program, it's often expected that they are able to accept responsibility and demonstrate accountability for their past abusive behaviors that they've learned new ways to avoid using abusive tactics in the future, and that they also come away uh, with a new or a changed belief system about the roles of men and women. Another popular type of treatment is cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, some Duluth-based programs do include elements of CBT, but this can also be used as its own standalone approach. This method was initially developed by psychologists and its approach to treatment in these types of intimate partner violence situations does tend to focus on the use of violence. So working with the offenders to realize that their violence can be predicted and that they do have the ability to change their thoughts and beliefs that would otherwise result in them using abusive behaviors. What I've also been able to find is that cognitive behavioral therapy is often broken down into a few different components. So first of all, the offenders are encouraged to explore their personal motivations for attending treatment and also make commitments to refrain from using abusive behaviors in the future. The second is then to identify and practice various crisis management techniques for situations that they might encounter within a relationship. So an example here would be using timeouts as well. So there can be some overlap with other programs. They also talk about anger and stress management, and these uh, could also include learning how to monitor and recognize what their warning signs are when they're becoming agitated. And they'll also learn some relaxation exercises. They also focus on um, the alternatives to using coercive tactics and aggression in their relationship and improving communication skills. And facilitators will often end this type of treatment by taking some time with the participant to review what personal changes they have made, areas where they may need some um, continued work, um, and also setting some realistic future goals. And then the third and final one that I will uh, share with you is narrative therapy. So this approach considers that humans interpret and assign meanings to their experiences. And so in a treatment setting, the participants are encouraged to reauthor their destructive and abusive stories into ones that would be more productive in the future. Todd Augusta Scott is someone in Canada who's been a key figure in developing and providing national training on the narrative approach to intimate partner violence treatment. So again, if you're in this field, uh, that name might be familiar to you. In these kinds of scenarios, the participants, again, may initially be required to attend some individual sessions with a therapist before transitioning into the group format. 
And this is to give them opportunity to consider some of their motivations for attending treatment and making sure that they are ready to take responsibility. The group format then typically includes uh, weekly sessions. Uh, they do do group work, but they also concentrate on their own individual reasons, their own stories as to how they justified maltreatment towards others and their partner. And like cognitive behavioral therapy, there are various stages that are covered in this type of treatment as well. So they'll first of all create the space for participants to look at and consider what their abusive behaviors are. They're also asked to develop a relapse prevention plan while also taking into consideration what their specific tactics were. They'll also concentrate on the effects of abuse and also ask participants then to consider ways that they can restore the negative effects that their abusive behavior had on others. I'd also like to take a little bit of time to talk more about the importance of gender and intimate partner violence. And I will start off with acknowledging that there are more gender identities than just male or female and not including other categories in this research is not indicative that they don't experience intimate partner violence. We do know that this does impact everybody. But the majority of research on this subject and the programs that are currently in place are still heavily geared towards working specifically with men and women or those who primarily identify as men and women. So this is where um, my focus does lie. There is a lot of debate as to whether male and female intimate partner violence is perpetrated equally. And for the sake of time today, I'm only concentrating on the arguments that would uh, be reflective of the feminist perspective, that female violence does differ from that of men and that women are more likely to be victimized. Of course, there are always exceptions to this, um, but there is a lot of research supporting that women's rates and contexts of violence differ from that of men and that it occurs largely in response to actual or perceived threats or attacks against themselves. Michael Johnson is someone who's established various categories of violence and abuse. And Evan Stark has also pinpointed that women are still more frequently the recipients of coercive control. So coercive control can also include physical violence, but also emphasizes non-physical tactics of abuse that have the intent to isolate, uh, intimidate, and instill fear in the victim. And he consistently finds that women are still more likely the recipients of that. If we look at intersecting uh, systems like race, gender, and class as well, these things are also consistently found when we look at the oppression of women more closely. So these combinations not only aid to, in keeping women trapped in an abusive relationship, but it also helps to explain some of the unique reasons why they may feel they don't have any choice but to resort to using violence of their own. Susan Miller is a researcher that has conducted numerous studies um, with arrested women in the United States. And she's consistently found that things like a lack of affordable legal counsel, possibly even manipulation from their spouse, fear of being separated from their children, um, and things like that um, often lead to women agreeing to take a plea bargain and acquire a criminal record um, in order to avoid some uh, more personal ramifications. But this kind of verdict can also then stretch into other issues. So you may see subsequent immigration problems child custody hearing concerns, reduced access to employment, um, all things that be, might, might be negatively impacted by a criminal record for violent offense. But if her actions were in fact self-defense or in retaliation to some other kind of abuse that she was already experiencing, this of course is really problematic. We also see a few concerns popping up in terms of mandatory arrest policies. An abused female might be arrested for violence if the police misinterpret her defensive behavior as that of the primary aggressor. And although the presence of injury does provide police with evidence that they need to determine that a physical dispute did happen, um, defensive wounds like biting or scratching do tend to surface a lot faster than offensive injuries. So these mandatory charging and, and pro-arrest policies could reflect a gender neutral approach to treating all forms of male and female violence at face value. Um, and this could be discriminatory if police and the judicial system don't or are just not able to or equipped to really question the context in which the violence happened. And if we look a little further into the court process, there are a couple of red flags here as well. 
Uh, many of the treatment programs for intimate partner violence were initially developed for heterosexual men who had abused their female intimate partners. But these gender neutral policies that result in the same procedures for male and female offenders means that women are being referred or mandated to attend these kind of treatment programs as well. So it's questioned if these are actually appropriate for women. Um, and one example that comes up a lot is uh, the emphasis on the power and control wheel that I showed you earlier. The creators of this tool specifically state that this is not a gender neutral tool and that that is reflective of male violence towards women. And one other concern is that women who might be inherently victims who are court mandated to attend treatment could be then given conflicting messages about if their actions were in fact abusive or not. Programs still often require that participants must not um, be claiming self-defense or have used self-defense in order to enter treatment. But if we look at programs um, that operate after a sentence has been implemented, this woman might have taken responsibility and pled guilty to something that was influenced by her history of victimization. So this has been recognized. Uh, what I laid out for you there um, is nothing new, and there have been some recommendations made by both researchers and practitioners as to how to make treatment programs more women-centered. So this can include things like adding counseling or other advocacy and support services in addition to the treatment program. But other suggestions are also to include more education in the program about emotional regulation, or understanding more about how emotional experiences can lead to violence. They also recommend that programs should consider further whether that participant is actually the primary aggressor or if they were responding to abuse that was being perpetrated towards them. And that there should also be some further um, assessments of various intersecting hardships that can frequently impact more women. So again, we're looking at systems like race, class, ethnicity, nationality, residency. I mean, there could be disability, age, um, you know, the list goes on and on. But so all of these things can also then lead to the needs for additional social supports, childcare, transportation, um, employment training, all of which we consistently see as reasons why many women are unable to leave an unhealthy relationship. And there have been a few programs constructed with an entirely different foundation specifically for the female offender, but these are still extremely uncommon. There's less than 10 that myself and other researchers have found um, in North America and the UK combined. Uh, but there was one that I did want to highlight because it does um, kind of set the base for, for some of my research that I'll get to right away. And this is in Quebec, and they have an intersectional feminist mutual aid group. Uh, when developers were creating this program, they did look for comparative programs, again, throughout North America to help in their development, couldn't really find any, so their approach is quite unique. Uh, and like other programs, it does have specific modules. So they'll initially concentrate on themes of violence, then they'll look at socialization and gender as a form of oppression and also looking at life conditions and considering that many forms of oppression can then interact with gender to create an environment where violence can happen or continue to happen. The objectives of this kind of group um, are not only to help the women find alternatives to using violence. So again, there's no dispute that women do resort to using violence, um, but also concentrating on empowerment and also helping women to achieve their goals with the support of other group members. So there's a very collaborative approach. Now, with all of that in mind, um, I will talk to you a little bit about what my particular research questions were in relation to that literature. So, as I've mentioned, um, there is recognition and, and some modifications being made um, to make programs more women-centered. But to my knowledge, there hasn't yet been a really thorough examination as to whether our Canadian criminal justice system supports the inclusion of gender-specific content or if it's endorsing programs that uphold that more gender neutral approach. 
I also haven't found any Canadian studies on the comparison of male and female treatment affiliated with the specialized domestic violence courts specifically. So I have a few research questions. Uh, first and foremost, are the treatment programs that are endorsed by the domestic violence courts in Canada gender neutral or gender specific? So in other words, are the male and female treatment programs operating the same or very similar, or are they completely different? I'm also interested in looking at whether programs recognize and address various intersecting oppressions that might impact women and their use of violence. And as well, are there any systemic barriers in accessing and attending treatment that might disadvantage more women as well? So again, I, I was concentrating on agencies that offer an intimate partner violence treatment program and receive referrals from a specialized domestic violence court in that jurisdiction. So this is a very specific and a fairly small population. Uh, fortunately, many of our Canadian provinces and territories have at least one specialized domestic violence court. Some have many more than one, but if they had at least one, then they were um, considered eligible to be included in my study. Newfoundland and Labrador, Quebec, Prince Edward Island, and Nunavut all currently don't have a specialized domestic violence court, so they weren't included in the study, and I didn't source any treatment in those locations. So unfortunately, that really unique program in Quebec for women couldn't be accessed uh, for my study. I decided that my research participants would uh, consist of facilitators of the programs, they're in a good position to not only comment on their own opinions of the program that they're facilitating um, and be able to talk about the more specific policies or the, the program formats, but in working directly with those group participants as well, they also hear that firsthand feedback and might be able to share more about what the individuals who are participating in the group think about it as well. So I did a mixed method study that had two phases. The first was a brief online survey that was distributed to program facilitators to collect some key information about the program's format and expectations. So I was asking a variety of categorical questions about things like the duration of the program, if there were fees required to participate, eligibility criteria, general rates of completion or dropout, what the treatment modalities are, um, and, and things like that. In total, I did get 22 facilitators that responded to the survey, um, but some of them also indicated that they conducted groups for both men and women separately. So in those instances, the survey uh, essentially directed them to answer all the questions twice, one from the perspective of the male program and one from the perspective of the female. So taking those extra numbers into consideration, I was actually able to gather data from 30 different programs. And then the second phase was a semi-structured interview um, over the telephone that inquired further about some of those survey questions, their opinions on program effectiveness, what works, what doesn't work so well, um, and things like that. And of course, all elements of my research was voluntary, um, but uh, just completing the survey didn't mean they had to do an interview, they could opt not to. And I did get 10 facilitators that uh, did complete an interview with me, um, which I was very grateful for. So there's just a couple of findings I can share with you today. And I, I feel like I do need to make it very clear, but apologize as well, that I don't have all of the answers and the results for you today. I have only just uh, completed the data collection process and the information is still very much under analysis, especially the interview content. I can't really speak to that just yet. What I can share though are a few findings that are coming out of the, the survey results that I don't think are going to change much at this point, so I'm more comfortable sharing some of that. But one of the main things is that there was no statistically significant relationship between the male and female groups when looking at the program's format and expectations. Now, from a research perspective, not getting a statistically significant result is often a bad thing or quite disappointing, but in my case, it actually supported my hypothesis, so I was actually quite happy to see that. Um, it, this could be indicative that out of those facilitators who did choose to respond and provide information about their program, the groups for women um, are being conducted in much the same way as that of the men. So we could be seeing a gender neutral approach uh, with those specialized domestic violence courts. 
Another possibly interesting finding, I think, is that as the literature has suggested, Duluth-based programs were still the most common method of treatment for both men and women. But I will say for my result, it was only marginally higher. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy um, was also selected frequently and came in a very, very close second. And narrative therapy was also selected often, but much more frequently for the male groups than the female. I think there was only one female program that indicated they primarily use narrative therapy. I'd also ask facilitators in the survey to select all of the various topics of education that might be included in their program. I was interested in seeing what kind of discussion points are also being included. There was room for them to enter their own if my list wasn't exhaustive enough, but I think that I'm seeing some interesting findings here as well. And I did make a couple charts for you. Um, I don't have the full list of all of the categories that were an option, but I do just want to highlight a few things. So these ones are the ones that were most frequently um, responded to. So here we have types of abuse, values and beliefs about violence and abuse, identifying warning signs, emotional regulation was high, which was good to see um, based on information that said that a lot of female programs really should um, highlight that as well. And it seems they do. Um, you'll see from the numbers, there were many more male groups than females. And I will uh, touch on that momentarily. But in general, as you can see from the percentages, um, most of the groups, again, both male and female, are reporting including these types of topics in their programs. Now, these ones are the least common. Um, and again, as you can see from the percentages, very similar rates of male and female groups are including these items. Now, on one hand, this is showing me again how male and female groups might share some similarities. There were no topics where there was a high number of female groups that were reporting talking about it and none of the men or vice versa. But this is leading me to think that there's a little bit more going on with the female group specifically here as well. If we look at these kind of topics, you know, we've got impact of living conditions, empowerment, self-esteem, socioeconomic impacts. If we think back to the literature and, and also the information that was stressed in the Quebec model for female offenders, these kind of topics are what researchers and practitioners are deeming necessary to be included in programming to make it more female-centered. Um, and yes, there's clearly a few, as you can see, that are modifying things or are including things pertaining to those discussions but they still occurred in less than half of the female groups that did respond to my study. And generally speaking, no real higher rates than that of the men. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, and this will be uh, my, one of my last slides here. Um, I don't wanna end on a negative with too many limitations, but there are things that I do need to highlight. Um, prior to the pandemic, um, I reached out to numerous agencies and what I thought gathered a lot of interest um, and contact information for a large number of facilitators or program managers that were, were willing to share the information. But uh, by the time my study materials were complete and I had ethics approval, we were well into April, which of course was a very bad time for all of us. Um, so programs were halted. Um, I do believe that some people may have actually lost their jobs uh, when I was having some more informal conversations with agencies about who their facilitators were. I did learn that there are some locations where the facilitators were contracted by the agency to run the programs, but weren't a, you know, a full-time staff member of that agency. And so with um, you know, work being on hold, um, I think that some of them may have just disappeared and, and not have been able to do their job. Um, and then, of course, there were other staff members that were transitioning into working from home or trying to figure out how to conduct programs or finish the programs that were already underway. So I do believe I lost a lot of participants because of COVID-19. Um, I ended up with about a third of the survey responses that I was hoping for. So this does need to be taken into consideration when we're looking at the results. It was already a very specific population and I did end up with a lower response rate. So it, it is difficult to generalize these findings. The positive thing though, is that I, I do believe I ended up with more interviews than I was anticipating and the pandemic might have actually helped me with that. 
there were a number of participants who did wish to do an interview who were either now working from home or just unable to run the groups. So actually had an hour to sit and chat with me that they might not have had under normal circumstances. I also had to adjust my research schedule to take into consideration various provincial reopening rates and when my participants might be settled into a new routine or allowed back into the office. So I did decide to leave my survey open for a longer period of time in order to allow those that were interested but just couldn't do it right away a chance to do so when it was more convenient. And then I just conducted the interviews concurrently with whatever schedule best suited them. So that extension is you know, the main reason why I don't have all of my results for you today, because that data collection process just lasted way longer than um, was initially anticipated. And then lastly, um, as I mentioned in uh, the previous slides, there were more male programs um, than females, as you saw from the charts. And that could be a limitation to the results as well in terms of that ratio. But I do think that this is at least somewhat reflective of the population because in some jurisdictions, not all, but some, uh, there may be two or three program options at various agencies that the male offenders can go to, and there may only be one for women. So it wasn't really surprising to me that there were lower responses for female programs overall because I don't think I was able to find as many of those as I was for men in the first place. So it does need some further exploration around that, but I, I thought it was something uh, worth mentioning. And then from here, um, I just need to continue analyzing my interview data. Um, but even with the limited information I do have so far, um, I do think it's yielding some interesting results and I am quite encouraged by what I'm finding. Uh, and I'm hopeful that I'll be able to share the final outcome once it is all complete. Um, if you are interested in anything pertaining to the literature, I do have a few reference slides um, that I believe will also be posted um, with the presentation afterwards. But um, I will leave it there for now. And thank you so much for listening to me. And uh, I understand we'll be doing some Q&A.